Hi, I'm Tim Matson uh, from Intel Corporation, and I'm going to present the paper Evaluation of Graph Analytics Frameworks using the, Gra the GAP Benchmark Suite. There's my disclaimer, which I have to show because I work at a corporation. But here's the disclaimer that really matters. So these are my views, not the views of my employer. And if I say something really smart, it's because of all of those people in that long author list I work with because they're really smart. And if I say something stupid, it's my own fault. And I want to emphasize I work in a research lab at Intel, so nothing I say here is going to give you any information about an Intel product. Um, so uh, my views are wild and crazy and off the roadmap, so don't, don't, don't think I'm announcing anything from Intel. All right, I want to start with, well, it's a frustration, you know. As Mark Twain would say if you're around today, there are three types of lies. lies damn lies and benchmarks. And I'm, it's a sad state of affair how true this statement is. And if you've been following graph analytics, you've seen examples of these, these following three points many times. So someone will brag about the performance of their amazing graph framework, but then they'll only show you data for a graph with properties that just happen to make that framework look good. Or another one is you come out and announce your fantabulous graph library. Oh my God, it's amazing. But then you only show performance for the one or two algorithms that make you look good. Um, or the one that really burns me up is you take your hand optimized library that you've just done everything to get the performance up. And you take a relatively small graph, probably fits in memory on your favorite hardware. You know, imagine that hardware is a really fast single processor. And then you're going to compare it to your competition with out-of-the-box performance, no optimization, and you're going to run on older, otherwise hobbled hardware. And a particularly egregious example is they compared a single processor with a graph that fit in memory to a collection of nodes in the cloud running a distributed computation over the small graph. And they did this because it made them look really, really good, but that was just, you're not comparing to the fair hardware. So I, I want to highlight this and just say that, look, we got to start doing it right. We, we really do. Benchmarks are something to take seriously and to do it right. So use a standard set of graphs from a neutral third party. So you don't get to choose which algorithms. You run the standard set. And someone who doesn't care which framework looked good or bad provided that set. Um, Likewise with the graphs, you know, the graphs come from a neutral third party so that uh, you don't choose the graphs. Some are big, some are small, some are awkward. You need a diversity. Um, and then finally, if you're going to compare frameworks, you run them on the same hardware and you put just as much effort into optimizing each and every one. These should just be the common principles of honest benchmarks. And we have to start holding people to this standard. So how did you do, how do you do benchmarks right? So in our project, we wanted to make sure every framework was run to its full advantage. So we invited the people behind each framework to run their own software. Um, we put everyone on the identical hardware. It was a high-end recent Xeon CPU. There were a pair of them on the board, 16 physical cores per CPU. If you turned on hyperthreading, then you would have from the pair 64 logical cores. Um, and then we use the GAP benchmark suite. Now the GAP benchmark suite gives you six different algorithms, five different graphs, and a high quality reference, reference implementation to compare performance against. And then finally, you have to make sure you have reproducible results. So those teams, and they did their own systems, compared against and ran, re-ran the, the benchmarks with other systems so that we didn't just say we were reproducible, we verified it. So I want to talk a little bit about the GAP benchmark suite from Scott Beamer, now at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So there's a specification online anyone can download, and uh, you can download the graphs, you can download the run rules, but the baseline code is high quality, and I mean really high quality. It's been picked over by many people. It's good baseline reference code, and it requires just C++ and OpenMP, so you can run it on just, you know, just about any CPU platform you wish. Um, and you can get it at gap.cs.berkeley.edu. Now, what Scott did to select the benchmark is he did a survey of 54 graph papers 
um, and ranked uh, the most commonly found kernels in those papers and picked the six most common. Page rank, single source, shortest path, connected components, breadth first search, triangle counting between the centrality. So that's how we get the six algorithms. And then he searched and came up with five graphs that attempted to cover the bases in, in terms of the features you look for in graphs. So they range in size from fairly small, 57 million edges to 2.1 billion edges. Um, but they have different properties, and, and I'm not going to read through them all here because that's, that's not useful in a video like this, but I point to the road. The road graph is a road network of the U.S. It's a rather small graph, but notice its diameter is about 6,304. So there's a zinger in this set that you know is going to be really hard for almost any graph framework, and that's by design because you want a diversity. Now, I want to say a little bit about the five frameworks. I want to start with the sweet, sparse implementation of the graph clause. Um, the idea here is mostly a focus on programmability. So um, the, the idea is in the community that's working on uh, treating graphs as linear algebra, that it's a lot easier to write a matrix vector multiply, for example, uh, as opposed to the code you see there for what a traditional breadth first search would be. So it's actually kind of easier. You have these bulk operations, these linear algebra operations that someone else can optimize. Um, and then you get all the properties of, of uh, linear algebra, the mathematics, to help you reorganize operators for maximum performance. You swap the operators mathematically consistently with an algebraic semi-ring. And, uh, and then we also have an, uh, a library of high-level algorithms on top of the graph laws called LA graph which were used in these. Um, so Galois from the University of Texas at, awesome, at Austin, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> it's a C++ library and a runtime. So um, you have your, your graph queries, graph analytics that fall into a scalable graph engine, which does data-centric operations over concurrent data structures. Um, and it can switch between bulk synchronous and asynchronous algorithms and support CPUs, GPUs, and clusters of CPUs and GPUs. Frankly, I studied Galois less for its use in graphs and more as just a role model for what we could do in just general parallel programming frameworks. It's a really impressive system. And I'm very excited to announce that they've just spun off a startup for commercial support of Galois in a company called Katana Graph. So go check it out, very impressive. Graphit is another system I'm, I'm watching very, very closely. This came, comes from the same group at MIT that brought us Allied, which has had a huge impact on the uh, visual computing world. Um, so what you do is you have an algorithm expressed in a DSL uh, designed around programmability so that people can easily write the, al the graph algorithms. And then you separately define a schedule to define the optimizations. Now this lets you, just by changing the schedule, map onto a wide range of hardware, including CPUs and GPUs. Um, you can hook in an auto tuner and, you know, the Halide -like people have already built uh, auto tuners that learn the optimal schedules. I'm just like really looking forward to when they can do that with Graphit too. So this is a line of research that really is fascinating to watch. And uh, so that's Graphit. We then have the graph kernel collection from uh, a group at CMU. So on one hand, you can think of this as, oh yeah, it's just a you know, collection of user-facing algorithms and kernels that, that people can call. But it's how they implemented those that makes this so interesting. So where, where this team stands apart is they take hardware software co-design to a new level. And they really study carefully um, how do you map onto the SIMD instruction sets, inline assembly, uh, careful thread local cache aware work buffers. So the internals of this system are really fascinating and let them map onto a wide range of hardware. And then NW Graph, this is from um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and University of Washington. And it's a generic C++ library 
And it basically uses concepts to uh, figure out how to compose graph types from uh, STL uh, containers. And then you combine that with STL async and TBB to get the parallelism. What what's, makes this system stand out is it's, it, it's a good exemplar of what you would do if you built a graph system out of the greatest and latest features out of modern C++. So th this is another system to really watch as, as time goes on. So these are the graph frameworks and this table comes from the paper. Um, go to the paper, look at it. I just want to mention a couple things. Notice we have three systems, Galois, the Sweet Sparse Graph Laws, and Graphit, which are high level abstractions of graph algorithms. And then three systems which directly code their algorithms in a low level language, uh, GAP, uh, the uh, GKC, and, and NW Graph. Um, another little tidbit I want to point out is that graph laws, so the sweet sparse is an implementation of the graph laws spec. The graph laws spec assumed you might want to do huge graphs and therefore requires 64 bit indices, which sweet sparse had to do. All the graphs in the gap benchmark suite fit within a 32 bit uh, index space. And so all the other systems use 32 bits. That gives them a bit of the edge when they come to performance. Um, so the algorithms used by the different graph frameworks, also this is another table that comes straight out of the paper, but it summarizes the, the algorithms used in GAP. So that's what you're comparing against. And then you can see here the algorithms used by each of the different systems, which overlap a lot with the GAP, but not completely. And the one that really stands out is for page rank. Um, uh, there's uh, Jacobi algorithms used in Graphit, Sweet, Sparse, and Gap, but um, these uh, G GKC, Galois, and NW Graph all use the gauss seidel algorithm. Um, the gauss seidel algorithm lets you update intermediate values before finishing a pass. And if you combine that with asynchrony, which Galois was able to do, it gives quite a, quite a performance boost. So um, go to the paper where you can learn a lot more like this. Now we spent a long time, gosh, it seemed like forever negotiating the run rules, but this is an important part of any serious benchmarking project. So everyone used the same identical input graph files, which have been incorporated into the uh, sparse, uh, sparse set at Texas AMM University. Um, the benchmarks were run in the Intel development cloud on the identical pieces of hardware. And then we had two data sets. The baseline is designed for what would someone get if they just downloaded the package and ran it. So we disabled hyperthreading. The NUMA policy was fixed at interleave equals all. If your auto tuners and specialized heuristics were enabled by default, you could use them, but no hand tuning was allowed. We made one exception, and that is you could play around with getting the delta parameter for delta stepping and single source shortest paths. You just have to do that. And then we defined what restructuring and renaming and transposition when you had to recount that time and when you didn't. The second data set was the optimized run, and there you were able to do whatever you wanted. Change the thread count, play around with the new policy. Uh, even modify the algorithm. So just to make your system run and show off as best as it could. So if we look at what the different systems did going between baseline and optimized, it actually utterly surprised me. So first off, NW Graph and JKC, the graph kernel collection, GKC, <laughs> the graph kernel collection, they just turned on hyperthreading and did nothing else. Now that's a real strength of those systems. They're not sensitive to end user knobs. That's what that says. Sweet Sparse pretty much did that too, just turned on hyperthreading. They did play around with the triangle counting algorithm and saw a one to 3% performance boost. It really wasn't significant. Graphit did some pretty heavy work moving from the baseline to the optimized. Um, they did some specialized optimizations for the road graph. Remember, the road graph is a nightmare because of that huge diameter. Um, and then they went in and did some work on the cache partitioning to improve locality for page rank. But remember, being able to do optimizations by modifying the schedule is what makes Graphit really stand out. 
Galois went the furthest in terms of uh, optimizations going baseline to optimized. So uh, sure, they turned on hyperthreading, but they also made estimates of the graph diameter and then figured out that the bulk synchronous algorithms worked best for low diameter graphs and asynchronous algorithms worked best for high diameter graphs. And so they put that heuristic in there. Um, all right, so here we show who got the best time for each of the case. And uh, the color code tells you who got the best times. Notice that uh, BFS, single source shortest path and connected components didn't run very long. There's were very, very short benchmarks uh, in terms of run times. But you can see that the gap um, baseline was number one, eight times versus nine. And you can see NW graph and GKC both did pretty well. Uh, but I just quickly track, you know, who got number one the most often. But when you go to the paper, what you see, and this is where you go to the paper and just study this to pull out what you're looking for, are these eye charts. Um, so what we're showing here is the speed up as a percentage where we compare the runtime of gap to the runtime of each of the cases. And it's red if you're slower than gap, it's white if you're about the same speed, it's green if you're faster. And we show up for the baseline and the optimized. So I emphasize that for the, the high level abstractions, graph loss, Galois, and graph it, they, they just kind of had a deficit imposed on them for the small run times, BFS, as a, a single source shortest path and connected components. Um, and that's just because the, the run time is so short. And you know, if they're a high level framework, there's an abstraction penalty you pay. So they didn't have a lot of work to offset that. The road graph was tough. Uh, everyone struggled with the road graph. Uh, because it's a small graph and it has a large diameter. GKC had heuristics that really reduced the overhead. Plus, the small size of the graph let them take advantage of uh, that small size and, and do a really great job on cache reuse. Galois did some very interesting things for BFS and PageRank with asynchrony. This is one of the cool things about Galois, is they can easily move between asynchronous and bulk synchronous execution. And that made a big difference in, uh, especially with their Gauss-Seidel algorithm in page rank. Graph it, it's interesting, uh, the, you know, early on when they started running, they just kicked butt on single source shortest path because they introduced this new algorithm, a bucket fusion algorithm. And, you know, Scott looked at that from the gap point of view and said that was cool and added it to the gap. So uh, it improved single source shortest path in the gap. Um, so I just wanted to give a call, call out to the graphic folks that, uh, you know, they, they actually led to an improvement in gap, which um, prevented them from having an all green row on a single source shortest path. And then uh, one interesting thing, I'm, I'm involved in the defi definition of the graph laws API. And so one of the things I was looking for with the sweet sparse work was, does it find pathological features where the API definition blocks the uh, sweet sparse people from implementing a system that took advantage of a particular algorithm. And we found that. It would be very, very difficult to incorporate intermediate updates into Gauss-Seidel. So we couldn't use the Gauss-Seidel algorithm. Um, so that's something I'm going to take back when I, when I analyze the graph laws API. Um, so at any rate, that definitely hindered some optimizations work for the graph laws. But there's a lot more optimizations work coming in the graph laws that we identified in this study. So stay tuned with graph laws. There's going to be some awesome stuff coming out of the sweet sparse graph laws over the, the next release uh, in, in the coming year. So in conclusion, look, no single framework dominates. Graph algorithms are just tough in general, it's parallelized and uh, they're challenging. So it, it wasn't too surprising that no one here is all green. Um, and I wanna emphasize that it was hard. It took us months of work together to get the run rules right and to really get a consistent set of numbers. But it's worth it because we can hold our head high and say that these are honest benchmarks that you can really use to understand the trade-offs made in these different systems. We do have future work it's intended though. I mean, we want, to, we want to look at more frameworks. We got this process down, let's look at more frameworks. We also need to look at a wider range of hardware. You know, CPUs are wonderful, but hmm, what happens with GPUs? Uh, I think we need to expand the study so that we look at programmability. That's important and this study didn't go there at all. 
And uh, particular is something like the graph laws, where that is our number one motivation is programmability, but also graph it. So thank you very much. <laughs>